Um, I want to start by telling us a story about a young girl who grew up in our church. Her name is Perrine. Uh, she started out in our children's ministry, and she grew up here, and she was part of our youth ministry. And then as she finished that, she went overseas to study. She got married there and settled uh, in Australia. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I think sometime in May, she was diagnosed uh, with stage 4 cancer. And just this month, on the 8th of November, she passed away. Uh, and even though it's been heartbreaking and sad as we've mourned the loss of a friend, of someone whom we've, many of us have seen grow up as well in this community, someone we love dearly, someone who truly, whenever she was around, uh, brought life and light to everything around her. And even though we feel the loss in that, there was something very significant about the celebration of her life uh, through these last few days and these last few weeks. And one of the themes that kept coming up was the impact that she made on people around her, uh, was the impact that she left in different people from all walks of life. She would meet somebody on a plane and become lifelong friends. And in that, she would leave an imprint of faith in that person's life. And so I started thinking, how is it possible for all of us to live a life so that we can make a lasting difference in the people around us? You know, today, this is the thought and the question that I have for us. How do we leave a lasting impression, a lasting difference? How do we make a lasting difference in those around us? You know, maybe for some of us, you've uh, worked hard and you've built, you know, uh, an establishment. Uh, you've built your business. You've got your home. You've got your family. You've got your country club. Uh, what all the five C's in this country? I still cannot remember. You've got your cash. You've got your condo. You've got your... I don't know, bubble tea, you know, uh, but you've got everything. And right now there's still a knowing on the inside. And that is that, is there more to life? I came today to say that there is more to life. If you're tuning in online, there is more to life. We are called to make not just a small difference. We are called to make a lasting difference, a difference that matters to those around us. And so if this is your question, if this is what's stirring in your heart, then I want to challenge, invite us to a journey, and a journey that we've begun 10 weeks or 10 parts ago called Unstoppable. And this has been our series through the book of Acts. Uh, if you're new to the book of Acts, the book of Acts tells the story of the early church. We've been just journeying through the book, and right now we're in chapter 5, uh, through this wonderful story of the early church and how God used that early church to make a huge difference. You know, as we think about making a difference, I don't know whether you're like me. Uh, but I very often find myself thinking about the challenges of the world around us. 2020 uh, has made us face to face uh, with a lot of challenge. Can I get? Yeah, uh, it's okay. You can go ahead and speak to me if you're in the room. If you're online, go ahead and put some aliens on the chat as well. Right? I mean, 2020 has had a lot of its challenges, and we've been faced with big problems, economic situations. We've been faced with us as a church as well, needing to do some new things and learn some new things. Uh, and I truly want to, uh, once again, want to honor the amazing team FGA uh, that's really served us so well through these last seasons and is going to continue to do that uh, in the seasons coming ahead. You know, as we think of the problems and the challenges of the world, it's not just because of COVID. There's economic challenges, there's political challenges, there's poverty, there's war, there's terrorism. Uh, there's so many things that seem so huge. There's the climate issue and the environment issue uh, that we're still trying to figure out solutions for. And I don't know about you, but I can sometimes find myself being just overwhelmed. It seems that these problems are big. It seems that these problems are significant. How do I make a difference? How on earth can one person make any impact on some of these big issues? And here's the thing is, if you ever uh, thought about it like how I think about it, you can come to the conclusion that it's just too big and therefore I don't do anything. You see, sometimes the danger of seeing the, the uh, immensity of the problem can lead us to uh, uh, an apathy, a lack of activity, a lack of action in what we need to do. But you know, today we want to look at something quite key. We want to look at the early church. We want to go back to our history as Christians, to our family story, and see what they did when they were faced with overwhelming uh, circumstances and challenges. Because that early church didn't have a comfortable beginning. They had a challenging beginning. 
That early church was under Roman rule, and so they had to live under the authority of a pagan government. They had to follow Christ in ways that were very different from every el everybody else around them. They also, because they were a new group of people, uh, had to deal with the religious authorities of their day. Now remember, by the time we come to Acts chapter 5, which is what we to look at today. Uh, the people didn't even have a name. They were not called Christians up, up to this point. In fact, they were just called people of the way. So why didn't you turn to someone next to you and on the chat, why don't you just put this, you are part of the way. So in spite of the political pressures that were there, in spite of the religious challenges that were there, by the time we get to Acts chapter 17, listen to what people said about this small group of faithful believers. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What a wonderful commendation. The people were not happy, obviously, but this is a wonderful commendation. Wouldn't you like to be a person, a community that people would say they have come in and they have turned the world upside down. And I like to suggest perhaps turn the world right side up. Can I get an amen? That God has called us as his people to step into this world to turn it right side up. Now think about this. This early church had no power. They were a small group of about 120 odd believers. They didn't even have the name that they were called. They were not called Christians. They had no power. They had no real influence. And yet, 17 chapters into the story, a couple of years only, some people say maybe 20 or 30 years only, they were known to be a people who left such a lasting difference in the world. And so this is the question for us today. How did they do it? Because perhaps for you and me, we too can leave a lasting difference. You see, the church really was unstoppable. It is unstoppable. Why? Because God is doing a work that he began many, many, many years ago. And he continues to be faithful to see it to completion. The work he began in you is also a work that God's going to see to completion. But the work he began in his church, he will move it forward. And so there is no war, no pandemic. No sickness, no hardship, no difficulty that will prevent God from doing his will. Can I get an amen? Truly, God's people are meant to be unstoppable. So as we pick the story up, we're going to pick it up from uh, verses 17. And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open it up and you can follow along. If you're tuning in online, you can get to a Bible app as well and you can tune in online. Uh, but if you don't have, I'm going to put it up on the screens and I hope this will assist us as we journey together. Now the text begins and says, but the high priest. And something that I've learned very important about the way we read the scriptures is before we can figure out what happens next, we need to remember what happened previously. And so the word but tells us that something happened previously. Now here's a quick reminder. What happened previously was this. The apostles had performed many signs and wonders. There were miraculous things taking place. People were being healed. Uh, people were being set free. Uh, in fact, they were so well known because of the healing ministry. The people from towns that were outside of Jerusalem came together and they brought their sick and God healed every one of them. And because there was this powerful book, healing and teaching was taking place. The high priests rose up, and all who were with them, that is the party of the Sadducees, a little sidebar in case you're not familiar with who the Sadducees are, these were a religious sect, so they were a, a group of religious people who had very unique belief systems, they were largely in charge of the temple, so they were in charge of the sacrificial system, they were in charge of uh, the running of the temple, and what did them, they were people of honor in that society, they were very important people. Big shots la, in the Christian world or in the church world, at least uh, in those days, in the Jewish community. The other thing you need to know about the Sadducees is this, is that they had a certain belief system. Uh, they did not believe in the resurrection. Everybody say resurrection. Because they didn't believe that God was going to come and resurrect us in the last days. Right? So they did not believe in the resurrection. And this is important to our story. The second thing is they did not believe in uh, angelic visitations. So they did not believe in angels. 
And this is also important in the journey of what we're going to take uh, uh, through the rest of this message. And so the high priest, together with these Sadducees, filled with jealousy. Jealousy is a bad thing, people. You know, so sometimes we find ourselves on Instagram, looking at other people, wow, their house is so nice, uh, their breakfast is so nice. Uh, they always go and eat all these nice brunch places. I never go to these brunch places. Wow, my boyfriend never take me, my girlfriend never take me. Don't be jealous, huh? It's not a good thing. So they were filled with jealousy. And what they did was this, they arrested the apostles. So as the apostles were healing and ministering and teaching, this group of people came to resist them. And what they did was they decided that they would take them and imprison them. Now, the other thing to note here is that this is the entire apostleship. So when you read the book of Acts, you'll find that on occasion, uh, Christians were taken into prison. Right? There's Paul and Silas. You have uh, you know, uh, Peter and, uh, and John who were taken into prison. But this is the apostles. That's important because through this situation, through this incredible moment, God is going to do something dramatic in all of them. And God is going to give them an instruction. So it's not an instruction to a few, it's an instruction to all who were then in prison. So this was to the apostles. And he put them in public prison. Now this is no fun, right? They were doing what was good, they were doing what God had called them to do, and they find themselves in prison. Now somebody say, but. Go ahead, somebody say, but. Because This word now tells us something is about to change. It was during the night. And someone once said, the night is a dark time. And we've all experienced a bit of darkness in our lives. In fact, this day I've come to say to somebody online and somebody in this room, you've experienced a dark season. But in the middle of that dark season, an angel of the Lord came and open the prison doors. In spite of the darkness, in spite of the challenge, in spite of the difficulty, God is never limited by our limitations. It may be our night time, but to God, he can do a miraculous deliverance. And God came in to these people who were behind bars, and God opened the prison doors. You know, in this season, over these last number of months, as we've been experiencing COVID, I wonder whether some of you here would say, you know, in my life, God has opened a door. It was dark and I wasn't sure for a while, but God opened a door. Would you, in the chat, write, what did God do? What door has God opened for you this season? Maybe God's given you a job where you thought there was no job opportunity. Maybe God's given you provision where you thought there was no provision. Maybe God's opened some relationships. Maybe God's connected you with a community. God has opened a door that has even, even though we find ourselves in the night season, he's opened a door for us. And so it was during the night, an angel of the Lord. So you see God has a sense of humor, right? Because remember the Sadducees? Remember what they don't believe? They don't believe in angels. But what does God do? God sends an angel in the night to come in and to open the prison doors. The other thought I have for us is this. Please remember that it is the Lord who opens prison doors. It is the Lord who is ministering to the people. Because the book of Acts, even though it sees the work of the apostles and the early church, it is the continued ministry of Jesus who now has ascended the throne. And so we get in the book of Acts, God who continues his ministry. Right now, God is still acting uh, on the earth. He works with his people, through his people, to the world around us. But it is God's ministry. He is the one who opens our prison doors. And so he opened the prison doors and brought them out. A miraculous moment. And when he brings them out, he says to them, go and stand in the temple. Go and stand in the temple. Can you help me just preach this? Right, we're all very quiet right now. So you just turn to someone next to you and put it in the chat. Go and stand in the temple. That's great. Go and stand in the temple. Here's the instruction. That the angel comes and sets them free. And once they are set free, the instruction is to go and stand in the temple. 
Do you know that we are meant, and the phrase go and stand means this. It means that we're supposed to go and establish our presence in a particular place. So God had told them to go and establish their presence in a particular place. The place for them was the temple. Do you know you and I have a place, a particular place that we are called to, that we are sent to, and we are called to go and establish our presence in this particular place. You have a temple that God is sending you to. Maybe for some of you, the realization is this, and this is a key thought. The realization is that your home is where God has sent you. And when God has sent you into this home, you are to establish the presence of God in your home. Can I get an amen? If you're in an office, you are to establish the presence of God there. If you're in the army camp, you are to establish the presence of God. If you're in a school team, if you're in a, a school club, if you're amongst a particular group of people, if you have a Facebook account, perhaps God will say, go and establish your presence there. You know, for some of us tuning in, God has called us to a particular city, to a particular nation. Go and establish God's presence there. It's key for us to acknowledge, to say in our hearts, to echo what the Lord has been calling you to. You have a particular place because they were set free in order to go establish the presence of God. You know, I want you to see in this short passage a picture of your life and my life. Because I don't know about you, but I was once in prison, not a physical prison, but I was in a prison of sin. And there was nothing I could do to get myself out of the, the prison of sin. No matter how much I tried, no matter how good I wanted to be, I was still in that prison locked by the gates of sin. And then one glorious day, Jesus came and he set me free from that prison of sin. And he delivered me from my past and he redeemed me from sin. And I know many of you sitting in this room and many of you tuning in online, you know what this experience is like. Where you have been born again and Christ has come and he has set you free. And you know this truth. He whom the Son sets free is free. Indeed. Indeed. But here's the thing. Our delivering is meant for God's commissioning. It is not just that we are delivered so that we can go to a bubble tea shop and get some bubble tea and go home and watch some Netflix. We are delivered in order to go and establish his presence. We are delivered because there is a mission. There is a purpose to our lives, and that purpose is more than just that we are free. Yes, there is a truth for us to come and see the presence of God and experience the goodness of God and know the love of the Father, but so that we would go and we would stand. What is your temple? Where has God called you? Who is the community that you and I are meant to go to and establish? As you're tuning in online, who has God called you to as well? You have a temple. You see, we don't have to change the entire world, but we can change our little corner of the world. You don't have to change the big problems of the world. And maybe some of you, God will raise you to that. But, but maybe there is a little corner of this world that God is calling you to leave a lasting impact to make a difference there is a little bit of your world that god is calling you to bring a change and i know some of you are saying this you know i'm the small fry la. you know i go into my office all the big bosses i just they take notes i keep quiet la, you know then try and get out as soon as i can do you know that you may be the smallest person in the eyes of the people around you, but in God's eyes, you are his ambassador. And as long as you know that in your spirit, when you step into that room, you bring the presence of God. You are called to establish God's presence in wherever you are. You may be in an army camp right now and you are the lowest rank. You feel you're the scum of the earth. But no matter what people put on you, what rank you may have, you need to know in the eyes of God, you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God, and you have His presence on your life. And when you go into this world, you carry that presence. So we don't have to change the whole world, 
but we get to change a little part of our world. So how do they do this? How did they change the world? How do we get to them turning the world right side up? It's this very simple thing they did. The angel comes and says, here's a reminder of the task. Speak to the people all the words of this life. Speak to the people all the words of this life. So if there's one thought I want you to remember today is listening, would you remember that we are called to teach the teachings of Jesus? Would you say that out loud on the count of three in the, in the chat? Would you write, teach the teachings? One, two, three, teach the teachings. We are called to teach the teachings. And if we will commit to an impartation of God's kingdom into somebody else, you will discover that you will leave a lasting difference in the world. So the phrase we're looking at is this, is to speak to the people, all the words of this life. A couple of thoughts around it. The first is the word speak. And now I want you to understand this, that the writer of the book of Acts, Dr. Luke, does not say shout and badger. Can I get an amen? You see, sometimes the Christians, we are so used to just shouting. Nobody's listening, we just shout and eat. Or we badger people. But here the Holy Spirit came in the form of an angelic visitation and said, I want you to speak. Do you know speaking requires thoughtfulness? Speaking requires us to think about what we want to communicate as we communicate it. And so we are called to teach this. And how do you know what this, this idea of speaking is? You see what they did. The moment they were set free from the prison, the very next morning, before the sun rose up, they all are found at the temple. Isn't that brilliant? They did not say, you know, wow, we were just in prison. Better go and hide first. The next moment, as soon as, even before sunrise, they go back to the temple. And what do they do? They start to teach the people. In fact, later on, they're going to be indicted with teaching the people about Jesus. So you and I, we are called to teach some people in our world. Maybe your family, your kids, maybe the community around you, maybe a friend, maybe even using the platforms that you have on social media and on Facebook. You know what? Don't use social media to complain and grouse and rant. Use it in order to establish the presence of God. Speak. Second, it says to the people. You know, sometimes we forget that we talk to people. Sometimes we think of people just as a project or something that we need to get done. But let's learn to speak to people, people who are very different from us, people who think differently from us, people who've got different thoughts and opinions, different experiences, different backgrounds. Let's never forget that we are called to teach people. You know, uh, many moons ago, yeah, very, very many moons now, I was once a teacher. And before I went to a school to teach, I had a wonderful professor who said this phrase that changed the way I approached teaching. She said this, she said, we don't teach subjects, we teach students. And that revolutionized it for me. It helped me realize that my goal is not to hear the content now. My goal is to understand who the student is and try and bring the truth to this student. And that's why I think preaching is very stressful. And if right now you think I'm doing okay, I tell you, I'm very, very, very anxious. Because the breath of us here and the breath of people there is so wide that it's sometimes hard to know that how do I teach everyone in a way that everybody can understand. But there's good news here because it's the work of the Holy Spirit who can take what I'm trying to say and then make, make sense to you. So I need you to do some work as well. Tuning in online, I need you to lean in and desire and be hungry for the seed of God's word. Because when you do that, God's going to open your eyes and you're going to see a truth and your life will be changed forever. We are called to speak, teach the truth to people. And so Paul says this to the church in Colossae. He says, let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Can you say those phrases? Full of grace. Head right in the chat. Full of grace, seasoned with salt. 
You know, every time we speak to someone and we teach them the truth and we talk about Jesus and we talk about the faith and we talk about what God has, we talk about the witness, we need to do it full of grace, seasoned with salt. Confession time. I love French fries. Anybody else in this room right now loves some French fries? Oh, praise Jesus. The best thing about French fries, obviously, is just a little bit of salt. If you put too much salt, ha, I'm to die. Just the right amount, it is ooh la la. Wonderful. You can just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Hence, I look like this. But you know something else happens with the eating of french fries? After you want to drink a lot. Why? Because it stirs thirst within us. See, Paul was saying this, when we talk to people, when we communicate with people, let's do it in a manner that is full of grace, full of favor, full of kindness, and in a manner that will stir within them a thirst, a hunger, a desire, a one-two. Make no doubt about it, we are called to boldness, but we're not called to pushiness. We are called with patience to be patient in humility as we declare the truth persistently. But we're called to rebel or to be obnoxious or to be arrogant. We're called to speak to people the words of this life. Know that in God's kingdom, there's a new vocabulary to learn. You know, we all have new vocabularies. When you join a new company, they have an onboarding process. And then they teach you the vernacular, the language of that company. You know, I know some friends who work in Google, and Google's got some very unique language that they use. They say it's very googly. You know, nobody else gets it. People in Google understand what that is. You know, in a company, maybe there are certain words that they use, certain phrases that they use. You know, in this church community, we say things like afraid. You know, that's not about rec- recklessness. It's about stepping out in faith and believing it. Even though you feel afraid, do it. Afraid. Do you know that there are words that is associated with God's life and God's kingdom? And if you and I want to enter into the full experience of this kingdom, we need to learn. And so God's words of life are, are, are words that include grace and peace and joy, but it also includes words like truth and judgment and sin. Because we are called not to just speak to them about the words of life that we like. We are called to speak to them about all the words of life. Can I get an amen? And so we're invited to teach somebody else the teachings of the full counsel of God, the full counsel of Scripture. So today I want to ask you this. As we move from here, will you teach the teachings to someone? I remember a long time ago, I was about 16 or 17, and I was part of our young adults ministry in this church. I was neither a young adult, you know, nor part of the ministry, but I was welcomed there. And so I was the youngest guy in this particular ministry. And I'd been in church, and I'd been singing the songs and listening to the sermons. And one day, two of the leaders from this ministry said, hey, Rodin, would you come for a Bible study? And I said, sure, I'll come for this Bible study. And so we came together, and these two leaders sat down with me. And they opened up a Christian track. How many of you ever remember Christian tracks? Yeah? Or some of you do. Some of you have no idea. Basically, it's a little booklet. And it's sometimes got comics in it. It's got words in it. And all these leaders did was sit down with me and open the track and just read it to me. Just read it one page after the other. But as they were reading it to me, they were reading uh, to me the gospel story. And suddenly, for the first time, I understood what the gospel was. I understood what the good news was, and my life has forever been changed because of that. In that moment, I understood what the grace of God truly meant, because not that I was in church and I heard sermons and I sang the songs and I was serving somewhere. It was because someone sat down with me, looked at me and heard me and understood me as a person, and then opened up and taught me the truth, and I have forever been changed. And some of you know what this means, because you have sat down with someone. Someone has sat down with you. And helped you understand the truth. So my challenge, my invitation, I think what the text is telling us to do today is to go into this world. If we've been set free and delivered and go teach the teachings of Christ to somebody in your world today. And if you're going to do that, I have a warning. The warning is you're going to face some resistance. 
This early church, they faced some significant resistance. What they faced was as they started to teach, after this high priest, and they wake up, the high priest go and they say, okay, bring the prisoners, bring the apostles. But when they go, they realize that the gates of the prison are shut, but the apostles are missing. And so everybody's perplexed. Alama, what happened? And so somebody runs in the middle of this meeting and says, the apostles are in the temple and they are teaching about Jesus. And so the people go in very nicely because they don't want to start a riot. They bring them back to this council. And the council says, why are you teaching? There is resistance. There will be resistance. If you want to teach someone the word of God and the ways of God, then you need to accept there will be resistance. People will say, no, I don't want to do this. No, you know, you're like this kind of. And in the midst of that, here's what they say. They say, we will obey God and not man. Because the men came and said, stop your teaching. But they said, no, no, no. We will continue to do what God has called us. And they demonstrated a patient persistence. Right now, if you are connecting with some people, you're believing that God wants to use you to make a difference in the people around you, would you be persistent? And would you be patient? It's kind of like one of those birthday trick candles. Have you ever had one of those? You know, you put a candle there and you light it and then, you know, you bring it out and then they, happy birthday to you. And then you blow out the candle and you think it's gone and then it lights again. And then you blow it out again and it lights again. Maybe you and I need to be like these trick candles. No matter what the resistance, we keep lighting up again. Can I get an amen? So even though there's resistance, let's go and teach the teachings of Jesus to a few people in our world. The second thing is this. We need to have an understanding and a confidence that when we teach the teachings of Jesus, his word has efficacy, meaning his word will do what it meant to do. And sometimes we will not see it, and sometimes we won't know what it is doing, but God's word will not return to him void. And so every time you in love and grace, season with Saul, sit down with someone and help them understand what is salvation, uh, what is judgment like in the kingdom of God. When they come and understand what the grace of God truly is, how does the law and the grace work together? What is it about the end times and how do we prepare ourselves towards the end times? What is justification as we sit down and help people understand these truths? In doing this, God's word will not return void. How many of you like to work for an organization that ROI is 100%? Pretty good, huh? That's our invitation as we teach the teachings of the scripture. So today, on single big thought, go and teach the teachings of Jesus to somebody. And maybe some of you are uh, tuning in or you're here and say, Rodden, how do I do that? I don't know where to start. I just want to give you a very simple resource that we have. It's called Being Rooted. And we put an a, a 11 a part series of teachings together about the foundations of the Christian message. Some of you have gone through Being Rooted, but here's my invitation, my challenge. Will you not only receive it, will you give it away? Will you teach it to somebody? And maybe in the seasons ahead, you will connect with a few and say, hey, let me try and teach this to you. Why? Because in doing that, we be obedient to what God has done in delivering us from our prison of sin. You know, if you'd like a copy of this, I think there's a, a printing cost to it, but you can send an email to info at fjsingapore.org. Um, we'd love to be able to resource this for you and help you say, come on, go into all this world. Teach the teachings of Jesus. I want to land with this and what is an important preface to everything that I've said so far. And that's this, our proclamation must be prefaced by purity and power. You see, before we come to Acts chapter 5, we have the beginnings of Acts chapter 5. In the first part of Acts chapter 5, remember the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira. And in that, as they came and they brought sin into the community, God judged them. You see, it's really important that you and I, as we proclaim and we teach people that we have also chosen to live a life of holiness. So our words have weight. We don't just, we don't just have empty words. 
Sometimes I like to say like this, before you tweet it, make sure you eat it. Make sure the truth of God's word goes into you before you throw it out. We need to grasp the truth and then we need to give the truth away. But let me also say this, it is sometimes more often than not in the giving of truth that you learn to grasp it. So don't wait to get a PhD in theology. Don't wait to go to seminary. Right now, if you have been taught a truth of Jesus and the truth of Scripture, will you commit to going and teaching a few the teachings of Jesus? And make sure we are living life of purity, a life that honors the Lord. You see, because sometimes we have a lot of words, but our action and our behavior and our lives don't correspond with the faith we profess. You know what I'm saying, right? And so the church needed to be a community that was pure in order to have the power necessary for the message. The other thing that's important in our preface is this, that the power came from the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be a great teacher. You don't have to go to NIE. I mean, if you're called to be a teacher in our schools, please go to NIE, get training. Huh? You know, next generation must be taught well. But you don't have to have any degrees in teaching. You need to have a heart of obedience that says, okay, God, I don't know how to do this, but I receive your power. That's why Acts 4 follows Acts 1 and 2. When the Holy Spirit came on them, they were empowered by this same spirit to go into this world to preach the good news. And that same Holy Spirit is available for you and me that we would receive the power and the teachings of Jesus. So go into this world and teach the teachings. You know, I started with Perrine's story, and the theme that came coming up about her life was this, that wherever she went, whoever she met, she just told them about Jesus. She just invited people to church. She just constantly had faith in her life. And she left a legacy, and a lasting difference. I think it's true of all of us. But if we today very simply would be obedient to say, I will just go and teach a few. I don't know how to teach everything, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to grasp God's truth and I'm going to equip myself and I want to teach the teachings to a few. Maybe we too will leave a lasting difference. The passage ends with, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They were unstoppable. You and I can enter into God's unstoppable move. We don't have to change the world. We can change our world by teaching the truth to people around us. Amen.